Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and uh, grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. Luke 24 is our text for the, this morning. If you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Uh, turn to page 1051 and you'll find our text. You'll be able to follow along with us uh, if you do that. And and just for the record, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, would you please take one of these with you? You see, we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. And, and so uh, we just uh, offer these as a gift uh, in the same way if you need some help with groceries or gas, you can pick up a gift card after the service. If you need help with Scripture, you can take one of these and uh, we would be glad to replace it with another one for someone else who might need one. Hey, happy Easter. happy Easter. I'm so glad you're here. I, you know, I really, uh, th- this is a wonderfully weird weekend, right? Can we, can we just go ahead and acknowledge that? Because this is not only Easter, but we're also celebrating another holiday today, which is? All right, so somebody, has somebody already got you on that today? A- anybody with kids, you've probably already been, you know, done that. You know, somebody's gotten you a little bit. Any of you already pull an April Fool's prank on somebody? You know, see, and and by the way, this doesn't happen very often because when I started getting ready, I go, Easter is on April Fool's. I I was like, when was the last time that happened? I'm I'm trying to remember. And this is the first time in my life that April Fool's and Easter have fallen on the same date. In fact, it only happens like two to four times a century. And uh, the last time it occurred was 1956. So how many of you are with me? This is your first April Fool's Easter kind of thing. Yeah, a lot of hands go up. It was not that way at 8 o'clock, by the way. Um, uh, I was in the minority in that service. Uh, But but see, I love Easter. I mean, I just confess. I mean, we're, we're gathering today, Christians all over the world, to celebrate the reality that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was raised from the dead to give us life, to forgive us, to, to promise us heaven. I mean, how do you not love Easter? I've always loved Easter. It's just a great, great day. Uh, but I have a love-hate relationship with April Fool's. You know, uh, I love the playfulness of April Fool's. I love the fact that, that kids are wanting to, you know, pull a joke on you and do all this kind of stuff. So I love that, that laughter and the fun of April Fool's. But I just confess, I hate getting pranked. Anybody with me? Anybody else hate getting pranked? See, a lot of you didn't raise your hands. So are you guys the prankers or <laughs> do you just love it? Like, oh, I didn't see that one coming. That was good. Uh, so the, the, the best prank that was ever pulled on me actually happened in a church. So I was uh, 21 years old. I was the young youth pastor at this church in Scottsdale. And, uh, and I happened to be wandering through the fellowship hall that day. And, and there was a group of ladies with food. So that got my attention because I was 21. And, uh, and I, so I stopped like, oh, what are you guys eating? And they said, oh, we're celebrating the Passover Seder. And then we're going to have like, you know, donuts or something. I'm like, oh, great. Can I have some? You're not going to eat all that, are you? And, uh, and, and so they said, oh, yeah, you can have some of the treats. But, but first you have to eat some of the bitter herbs that were part of the meal. And I was like, oh, okay, I, I'm in. I'm 21. I can eat stuff. And uh, so the, the pastor's wife, who was this like prim, proper, holy, like, you know, perfect example of a pastor's wife, said, here, try some horseradish. <laughs> now I was 21. I was young, naive. Uh, I didn't really understand horseradish. The only experience I'd had with it was at Arby's with horsey sauce, right? And I like that stuff. So I was like, oh, great, horseradish. Yeah, I like horseradish. And so I took it, and she gave me like this big old wedge. And, uh, and she goes, oh, and it doesn't have much flavor, so bite down hard. That's when I learned that pastor's wives lie. So, but don't tell my wife I said that. So, um, so I popped that in my mouth and I bit down hard because I was stupid. And, uh, and suddenly my nose became a faucet. My eyes were screaming tears and I could not breathe. And the only thing I could even see was a, a group of ladies, you know, they're all old enough to be my mom laughing their heads off at me. I hate getting pranked uh, because I don't like feeling foolish. Now, 
Uh, by the way, I don't know what your best prank ever was, but you guys now have a lunch conversation topic to share the best prank ever pulled on you or the best one you ever pulled. So, uh, so today's Easter, and it's on April Fool's, and so I want us to look at the Easter story from the perspective of the greatest prank in history. I realize that may strike some of you as a little bit sacrilegious, but stay with me because uh, I think it makes perfect sense. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. Now, this is uh, uh, happening on Sunday morning. Uh, on Friday, Jesus was crucified. He was buried on Friday. He was in the tomb Saturday. This is Sunday morning, so it's the third day. And, and it says this, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they, a group of women, went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Did you notice all the surprises that occurred in that story? Because a lot of us have read that story before, and so we're used to it. But, but did you catch the surprises? What they did not expect to happen. First of all, the women didn't expect the stone to be moved, and they didn't expect Jesus' body to be missing. And then they didn't expect angels to appear, right? Showing up, hey, why do you seek the living among the dead? Uh, and, and then they didn't expect that the angels would remind them what Jesus told them. This was crazy. But Jesus actually told the apostles three times in Scripture. If you read the Gospels, three times, hey, i got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over to evil men. They're going to crucify me. It's okay. I'm going to rise from the dead. And, and then when they told the apostles what had happened, the apostles dismissed it as nonsense, as foolishness. So the greatest miracle in history appears like it's an amazing prank and everyone is made the fool. I mean, everybody in the story had to feel foolish, right? I mean, the, the women show up to anoint a dead body with spices and they're told he's not here, he's risen. I feel kind of foolish, you know? It's like showing up at a party thinking it's a costume party and it's not, you know? You're gonna feel kind of foolish. You got the wrong stuff. And then the, the angel said, hey, don't you remember Jesus told you these things while he was with you? Come on, that had to be the greatest duh moment in history, right? Have you ever had one of those where you just felt like, I can't believe I was that stupid? I did, oh yeah, now I remember. And then they told the apostles. I, I would have loved to have been there. Uh, the women come to the apostles and, and they said, hey, guys, you know, the angels told us he's alive and the tomb's empty and... The apostles are like, you women, you're crazy. That's foolish. We're not falling for this. Get out of here. Oh, hi, Jesus. I mean, come on. You know, you just told these women that you don't believe, and then Jesus shows up. It's going to be kind of like uh, one of those, uh, I guess I feel a little bit foolish right now. And what about Thomas? Come on, doubting Thomas. He wasn't there when Jesus showed up the first time to the apostles. And he's like, I'm not going to believe you 10 people who tell me this. I'm not going to believe unless I put my hand in his side and my finger in the nail print. A week later, what happens? Thomas is there with the other apostles. Jesus shows up. You don't think he felt a little bit foolish? Uh, it's okay, Jesus. I don't need to put my hand there. Thomas, give me your hand. Come on. Let's do this. You see, everybody felt foolish in this story. And, and honestly, I hate being pranked because I hate feeling foolish. Right? I mean, I did enough social face plants in high school for all of us. I, I don't want to feel foolish again. But that said, I choose to be a fool for Jesus. 
I choose to be a fool for Jesus. Uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says this. He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross is foolishness. In other words, if, if you're not a believer in Jesus, you know, you can't sing that song we just did. If you don't hold to those truths, then um, it's kind of crazy and foolish for you guys to be here on a perfect day on a Sunday morning. It's kind of crazy for, for you to follow or believe in a, a guy who lived 2,000 years ago and he was executed as a criminal. It's really crazy for you to actually read this book and do what it says. It looks foolish from the outside. But if you know the life-changing power of Jesus Christ, if you've experienced it, then it makes perfect sense because you understand God's power has changed your life. So today, I'm going to, you know, invite all of you to join me in being a fool for Jesus. That's really the whole purpose of, of this message. I want to invite you to join me in being a fool for Jesus because I believe it's the best option available for us. You see, if you believe that Jesus existed as a real person in this world, and, and by the way, the historical evidence for the reality that Jesus lived in this world is overwhelming. There's not a legitimate scholar anywhere that really disagree with the fact that there was this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, and, and he did uh, cause quite the stir in first century Palestine, and he was executed by Rome. That, that much is, is secular historical documentation. Um, but if you believe that Jesus existed, then you have to decide what you're going to do with Jesus of Nazareth. What are you going to believe about him? And uh, there are really only three options for believing about Jesus. And I borrowed this outline from Josh McDowell, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. He wrote it back in the 70s uh, about his own conversion experience. And, uh, and so I heard him actually teach this uh, 30 plus years ago. And, uh, and it stuck with me. And I want to share that kind of concept with you today. See, lots of people talk about Jesus as a great teacher or an inspiring leader or an amazing prophet. And I submit to you that he can't be those things. It's, it's actually impossible uh, for him to be those things. There's really just three options that you can believe about Jesus Christ. And, and I want to share those with you. So you can believe, first of all, like I believe, that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. You can believe that Jesus is actually the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, that he died on the cross to pay for sins, that he was raised from the dead, uh, ascended to heaven, and he's going to come again one day. Now, now, see, that's the biblical account of Jesus, and that's one of our essential beliefs here at Calvary, and, and we preach that, teach that, because that's what we believe. And, and we believe that because that's what Jesus claimed to be, Lord. Listen to the words of Jesus. This is Jesus talking about himself. Uh, John chapter 3, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, uh, I'm the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. In John 10, he said, I and the Father are one and the same. Later in that conversation, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You've seen God. In John 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. In John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus actually said, listen, uh, I'm the God in the flesh. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Savior. I'm the one who can forgive sins and take you to heaven. So Jesus can't be a good guy or a great teacher or a prophet because of what he claimed to be. You know, if, if he's not the Son of God, then Jesus obviously isn't uh, Lord. And, and so I hope today that you believe that Jesus is Lord. That, that's, that's my hope and prayer for you. Because Scripture says if we confess with our mouths Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We'll have eternal life. And you got to see eight people this morning declare their faith that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
That's what baptism is. That's your declaration, your statement to the world that you're a follower of Jesus, that he's changed your life and made you new. And, and they proclaim Jesus as Lord. I, I, I hope that you join with them in doing that because I know Jesus has changed my life and I know he can change your life. And because if you don't believe that Jesus is Lord, you're left with the other options. So Jesus Christ is Lord. You can believe he's Lord. You can also believe that Jesus is a liar. He's a liar, a con man, a deceiver. Because if, if he isn't the son of God and savior of the world, then he lied. That's why he can't be a great teacher or an inspirational figure because how many of you, you know, are inspired by people who lie? You know, we call it padding our resume these days, right? How many people have, you know, gotten fired because they lied on their resume? Well, if Jesus isn't the son of God, he lied on his resume. And he's not trustworthy and he's not true. And, and, uh, and now lots of people will gladly agree with me. Oh, that's right. Jesus, yeah, you know, he, he's, he's a liar. Yeah, you know, the apostles just invented Christianity after Jesus was killed. You know, he, he, he was a teacher and then they just made all this stuff up. Really. So the apostles perpetuated a big fat lie. Why would they do that? Did, did they stand to gain uh, a lot of wealth by, you know, telling this lie? No, they didn't get wealthy. I mean, some people want to say, well, the church got really wealthy. Yeah, about 500 years later. Well, did it give them a lot of power? Well, I guess if you call leading a bunch of poor people, you know, uh, power. But they didn't have positions in the public. They didn't have government control. They didn't have an army. They didn't have any of that stuff. So they didn't have power. Did it give them health and long life? <laughs> Absolutely not. In fact, uh, 10 of the 11 left apostles. By the way, you know, there were 12 apostles. And then after Judas betrayed Jesus, he killed himself. So now there's 11. Out of those 11, 10 of them died horrible, excruciating deaths. Most of them were crucified like Jesus. Peter refused to be crucified like Jesus. He was crucified upside down. Several were beheaded, one was run through with a spear after being tortured, and one was skinned alive. Yeah, the one who wasn't executed uh, was sentenced to, to live out his life alone on a, a rocky little island in the Mediterranean all by himself. You see, they lived in poverty, they were persecuted, they were imprisoned, they were executed. And I ask you, does anyone make those kinds of sacrifices for a hoax, for a lie, much less a whole group of people? Now, for me, the easy answer is no, but uh, don't just take my word for it. Uh, there's this guy, uh, by the way, how many of you know what Watergate is? Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, go home and Google it, okay? It's a big deal in the 70s. But there was this guy uh, named Chuck Colson who was one of the co-conspirators in Watergate. You know, one of the biggest presidential fiascos, if not the biggest, in the history of America. And, and he says this. Uh, Chuck Colson says, I know that the resurrection of Jesus is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. Okay. Here's what he says. Twelve men, got the number wrong. Twelve men testified they had seen Jesus uh, raised from the dead. And they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Every one of them was either beaten, tortured, stoned, or put in prison. They wouldn't have endured that if, they, if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. So you think 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. So Jesus is Lord, Jesus is liar, or Jesus is a lunatic. He's crazy. He's nuts. He's insane. I mean, I'm talking about the options that you really have to believe. I mean, and Jesus did teach his followers some really crazy things. I mean, if you read what Jesus taught, I mean, people who say Jesus was a great teacher, I always going to go, really, have you read his stuff? Because Jesus said this. He said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Oh, Jesus, you want us to love the people who are trying to hurt us. You want us to pray for our enemies? Okay, I'll pray. I'll pray that God drops a giant rock on their head. <laughs> no, it's not what he meant. 
actually meant that he wants you to pray for the people who are trying to cause you pain. And, and he actually wants us to love them because he really believes that love conquers all. That's crazy. It doesn't stop there. He actually told us, he said, I want you to forgive others like you want God to forgive you. Well, I don't know about you, but I want God to forgive. How, how many of your sins do you want God to forgive? All of them. Yeah, I want God to forgive me of all my sins. And so Jesus said, okay, I want you to forgive others of all their sins against you. And we're like, yeah, but Jesus, you don't know what they, oh, I guess you do know what they did. <laughs> and you still want me to forgive? Yes, I want you to forgive them. That's kind of crazy. How about this one? Jesus said, if you want to be great, and I think most of us really prefer greatness to not greatness, but he goes, if you want to be great, you have to be the servant of everyone. Servant of everyone. And, and, and we're like, yeah, but see, being great in my mind means that other people are serving me and I get to boss them around and they're doing what I want. And Jesus said, no, if I served you, and he got down on his hands and knees and washed the apostles' feet, if I served you, then I want you to serve one another. If you want to be great in my kingdom, you got to serve everyone. It's crazy. Or what about this? This is just blanket nuts. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and come follow me. Hey, wait, Jesus, wait a minute. To, to be one of your people means I've got to practice self-denial, and I've got to be willing to die to follow you? He's like, yeah. That's what it means. Okay, so let's just agree. That, that teaching is kind of crazy. And, and history tells us that there's been a lot of crazy, charismatic people who've gathered followers and led them to really bad results. So was Jesus just a crazy man who inspired loyal followers? His opponents actually answered that question for us. The story is in the, the book of Acts chapter 5. And it goes like this. It's just a few months after Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead. And the apostles are preaching all over Jerusalem uh, about Jesus. And they're preaching about the Sanhedrin, the, the religious leaders that had him killed, you know, about how they crucified God's son and everything. And so they arrest the apostles. They bring them in. And they're mad at them. They're threatening them and saying, hey, you guys got to stop teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus. You got to quit doing this. You're making us look bad. And the apostles pretty much preached at them and said, well, yeah, you killed the son of God. You ought to feel bad. You know, we're not going to stop because we can't help but tell what we've seen and heard. And as far as we're concerned, we have to listen to God, not you guys. So the Sanhedrin, the leaders, they were like, we got to kill these guys. You know, let's do to them what we did to Jesus. And one of them, they put the, the apostles out of the room, and one of the guys who was not a follower of Christ, he got up, his name is Gamaliel, and he said, guys, wait a minute, before we go on this mass execution thing, uh, think about this. You know, a uh, decade ago, there was this guy, and uh, he claimed to be a Messiah and gathered a bunch of followers, and he got killed by the Romans, and all his followers scattered. And a few years ago, there was another guy who claimed to be a Messiah, and, and he got some followers, and it was a big deal until he died, and, and then it just kind of dissipated. And then he says this. In Acts chapter 5, he says, If this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. So, three options. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is a liar, or Jesus is a lunatic. Jesus is the Christ, he's a con man, or he's crazy. Which one are you going to choose? You see, personally, I believe Jesus is Lord. I choose to be a fool for Jesus. I mean, he's changed my life, he's set me free, he's promised me heaven, he's blessed me incredibly. I would be a fool not to follow Jesus. But I can't choose for you. I can only choose for me. So what's your choice going to be? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is liar. Jesus is a lunatic. And whichever one you choose, does your life reflect your faith? Whichever one you choose, does your life reflect what you believe or what you say you believe? Uh, because... If you believe that Jesus is Lord, then you will want to learn more about him. You'll want to follow him. You'll want to obey him. You'll want to serve him. You'll want to believe some of those crazy things that he taught and apply them to your life. 
You know, I hear lots of people tell me when I invite them to church, they go, well, you know, I don't want to go to church because church is filled with people whose life doesn't reflect their faith. They use other words for it, but I thought I'd be kind this morning. And, and see, here's the reality. None of us, none of our lives reflect our faith perfectly. And most of us would really like to get better at our lives reflecting our faith. We'd really like to live what we believe. Uh, and that's why I'm just going to encourage you to come and hang out with us here at Calvary on a regular basis. Because this is a place that is filled with grace. And so no matter what mistakes you've made, what ways you've failed, no matter how you've rebelled against God, no matter if you're coming out of addiction or your marriage is on the rocks or your, your kids are a mess or, or you're failing financially, it doesn't matter to us. We're all a mess here and, and we're just celebrating the grace of God and the fact that God has healed us and is leading us to life. So you are welcome to come and join us on this journey. And, and, and if you come here, we want to teach you the Bible. We really want you to understand God's wisdom and how you can live a blessed life and, and, and experience that love and that grace that he's talking about. And, and if you come here, we want to connect you to a small group. We call them life groups here at Calvary, where you can hang out with other people who love God and who are learning to follow him, and you can encourage one another and, and learn together and serve together and share life together. And, and if you come here, we're going to encourage you to be the people of God that he created you to be. And we're going to encourage you to live your life so that it reflects your faith. Because we know it's really easy to walk in here and say, Jesus is Lord, and walk out and live the same. And here at Calvary, we exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we know that no matter what situation you're in or what place life has you, that Jesus has the power to change your life. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So I don't know about you, but for me, Jesus is Lord. That's what I choose to believe. And I choose to be a fool following Jesus. And today, honestly, I hope you'll choose that too on this April Foolish Easter. <laughs> Let's pray.